Good morning to you. Welcome to Sunday School. Good to see Brother Max back in the States. Amen. Praise the Lord. All right. <clears throat> Let me go and read a little. I got a, we have a little um, thank you card from Sister Sandra and Larry. It says to Calvary Baptist Church, I'm so lucky to have joined our, this church, our church. Thank you for everyone's prayers for me before arriving here. I am so grateful for everything uh, our church did uh, for my son and me. As soon as I arrived, as soon as we were arrived, our church friends began helping us uh, to settle in with gifts for the, uh, our kitchen and, and a bed and clothing and for helps with our vehicle, uh, our car. Everything that you did made us feel so appreciated. Uh, and uh, I was the lost lamb that finally returned home. How lonely I was before and now how warm I feel being with our church. I really appreciate everyone's help. Uh, so nice of you, friend. Okay, I'm reading a different part. I'm so happy to be. Uh, one of the family members in the church. I hope to do more for the church in the future. Sincerely, Sandra and Larry. Amen. So, praise the Lord. Thank you for that very kind note, Sister Sandra. And may God continue to bless you and Larry there. All right. Okay, let's, uh, <clears throat> we got a lot going on today. Let's have a wonderful time in the house of the Lord today. Amen. You'll have a good time in church if you intend to. Amen. And so, praise the Lord. Uh, let's continue with our Bible study. We're studying the uh, history of Bible manuscripts now. <clears throat> and as we mentioned last Sunday, uh, throughout history, you'll find that there, there's actually two histories. <clears throat> there's the history of the pure Bible, and then there's the history of corrupt Bibles, because they both come from a different stream or a different line of manuscripts. And so right now we're looking at the pure text and what we've been discussing is how that uh, in reference to the pure text it'll have different names, okay? Sometimes we'll refer to them as the received text, other times as the traditional text, sometimes it'll be referred to as the majority text, as uh, other times some may even refer to it as the Antiochian text, okay? Why these names? Where, the, where do these names come from? And then in regard to the corrupt text, sometimes they'll be referred to as the critical text, the Gnostic text, the minority text, the Alexandrian text. And so going forward, <clears throat> we're going to look at all the different reasons, some, or some of the different reasons why these texts are referred to the way that they are, okay? But continuing with the traditional text, this is the good line of manuscripts. The, this has to do with the line of manuscripts that support and underlie our King James Bible. <clears throat> a fellow by the name of John William Burgon, he, uh, a very staunch defender of the traditional text of the King James Bible, and a very fierce opponent of all of the uh, other types of manuscripts or the, cr the critical texts that support the other Bibles outside of the King James, Dean Burgon wrote <clears throat> in regard to the good text. He said, call this text Erasmian, <clears throat> or Complutensian, the text of Stevens or of Beza or of the Elzevers, call it the received or the traditional Greek text or whatever other name you please. The fact remains that a text has come down to us which is attested by a general, general consensus of ancient copies, ancient fathers, ancient versions. In other words... <clears throat> What Dean Bergon is, is, is telling us here is that the type of text that uh, it, it supports and underlies the King James Version is a type of text that is supported by manuscript evidence that you can find all throughout history dating from today all the way back to the times that the church was first started after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And if you think about it, that only makes good sense because as we've already studied with the doctrine of, of preservation, that's exactly what God promised to do. He said that he promised 
that he would preserve his words in every generation. And so considering those precious promises, it should not surprise us if we find uh, discoveries of, of manuscripts that support the, the pure Bible, the right Bible, the right type of text, and if we should find that type of evidence in every century, in every era, in every time period. You see, uh, I've said this before and I want to say it again because it's something I, I would like for you to get a hold of. We believe in preservation, Amen. not restoration. Amen. Now, you, you have to understand the fundamental difference between our line of thinking as Bible-believing Christians and the line of thinking, the mentality of those that are, are, <clears throat> are okay with any type of Bible. Okay? Uh, those that, because you have scholars... Okay, uh, those that folks would consider to be experts and authorities when it comes to those that study Bible manuscripts, you have those that oppose our school of thought. Okay, and what you have to understand is why do these Bible scholars, okay, now there are Bible scholars like Dean Bergon, for example, who support our school of thought, but what is the mentality behind these other so called Bible scholars that are not King James Bible believers like you and I? They're okay with the New International Version or the American Standard Version or the Revised or any of these other ones, the ESV, okay? Uh, what is their line of thinking? Well, they don't believe in preservation like you and I. In fact, some of the verses that we've already studied, okay, uh, they, they don't even believe that uh, many of those verses or some of those verses are in reference to the preservation of the words of God. They would interpret those verses to refer to the preservation of something else, okay? We believe that the, the, the scriptures are very clear that God has promised to preserve his word in every generation. That's clear to us, but you have to understand that's not so clear to other people. They think differently, and what they believe in is restoration. We believe in preservation. They believe in restoration. What does that mean? What that means is when, when Vaticanus, when the, we're going to study the, going forward, we're going to study the corrupt manuscripts. Right now we're looking at the pure line, but when we get to the corrupt line, we're going to look at some of the, uh, the manuscripts, the corrupted manuscripts, and you're going to find that the two most famous of the corrupted manuscripts are the Vaticanus and Sinaiticus manuscripts, okay? And these two manuscripts, scholars claim that they date all the way back to the 4th century. Of course, we're also going to look at evidence that opposes or contests that claim, all right? But regardless of whatever time period those manuscripts come from, okay, uh, some say they come from the 4th century, others say that they come from a different time. But what those who are not King James only Bible believers believe is that the, Lord, the Word of God was basically lost as far as the pure, copy, pure copies of the Word of God were lost for so many, not just so many years, for so many centuries, and then later, uh, these uh, manuscripts such as Vaticanus and Sinaiticus were rediscovered to guide uh, textual critics to be able to put together a more accurate uh, text according to their school of thought, okay? They believe that Christians went for, in other words, they believe that Christians went for many years, many decades, even centuries without a pure, okay, a, a, a pure copy of the Word of God. And it wasn't until scholars and archaeologists discovered uh, certain manuscripts that a pure representation of the Word of God finally, after so many centuries, finally became available. Brethren, the problem with that school of thought is it does not line up with what the Bible says about itself. Amen. That's the problem that we have. You see... We say that we are Bible-believing Christians. What does that mean? That means that our final authority is not some scholar, some boring scholar in a musty study. <laughs> no, our final authority is not any man. Okay? The Catholic Church, they have several authorities, the Pope being one of them. We don't recognize a Pope, any Pope. Our final authority is the Bible and in English, namely, the King James Bible, okay? Now, here's the thing. That offends so many people, and the reason why is because, 
It's the same problem human nature has had since the beginning. The reason why people have an issue with churches such as ours that insist on the Bible being the final authority is because, brethren, let's face it, most people are just downright rebellious. People don't want authority. People want to be able to do their, their own thing. They want, to, they want the liberty to live life their own way. And so any preacher, listen, folks don't want a preacher that's going to talk uh, conclusively. They don't want a preacher, and they definitely don't want a preacher that's going to talk authoritatively. They want someone that's going to make them feel better about themselves. And listen, I'm not even saying that I necessarily don't want you to feel good, okay? I mean, like James Brown, I feel good. <laughs> not for the reasons why he felt good. I feel good because I'm saved Amen. by the grace of God, <laughs> okay? Please forgive me for referencing James Brown. He, he should have got saved. But I'm just saying, that's what people want. They want a James Brown type preacher. They want to feel good. Well, look, if you'll get saved, you'll feel really good. But the problem is a Bible-believing preacher is going to tell you the truth. And not only are they going to present the truth, but they're going to do so in an authoritative manner. And that's what people don't want. People don't want someone that's going to speak authoritatively. Okay? They definitely they don't want politicians that will speak with any kind of authority. They don't want, and they definitely don't want preachers. They don't want anyone. L listen, children don't want parents that are authoritative anymore. And society, modern-day woke society, will back up the children for rebelling against any parents who would dare to be what parents are supposed to be, authoritative. Okay? Folks don't want authority anymore. I mean, go to the public schools. You think these teachers have any kind of authority? I mean, there was a day and time when teachers were allowed to discipline their children. Try that today. You'll, be, you'll find yourself in jail. You'll find yourself in all kinds of legal trouble. And I'm just saying, uh, authority is a thing of the past. People don't want authority anymore. And so when you have some, a, a Bible-believing church with Bible-believing Christians and Bible-believing preachers that insist that, listen, here's our final authority. It's not a pope in Rome. It's not some creed, okay? Uh, no, it's the word of God itself. People don't want that. People don't want that. And so, as Bible-believing Christians, we believe what the Bible says about itself. And that's the problem we have with modern-day scholarship, these, these ones that support these, these new Bibles. They have theories that in and of themselves may even sound good. The problem is they don't line up with what the Bible says about itself. God promised to preserve his words. And so, when you tell me or you indicate that the pure scriptures have been lost for so many years, but hallelujah for these uh, modern-day scholars that have finally discovered enough manuscripts to construct a much more accurate text. And they're constructing a much more accurate text all the time because they come out with new Bibles like hotcakes nowadays. Uh, why do we, brethren, why do we have over 200 versions of the English Bible? We need that much? You hit the nail on the head. We really need over 200 versions of the English Bible. Meanwhile, there are over 3,000 languages on the earth that don't have one verse of scripture in their language. Not even a bad one. Now, now take a second to think about that, brethren, to see how messed up this whole thing is. Here in the United States of America, okay, uh, and in the English-speaking world in general, not just in the U.S., but we have over 200 versions of the Bible in English. Do, listen, do you understand how much money it costs to print Bibles? They're not printing this stuff for free. It costs thousands and thousands and tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands for ink, for paper, for the material. And you know, spoiled rotten Americans, we're not going to go down to the Dollar General and buy a 99 cent Bible. No, you want a, you're going to want a nice leather-bound Bible. You're going to want a Bible of nice material because we're just spoiled. Amen. Yeah, I'm not even trying to criticize you. I'm right there with you. If you can afford one, get the nicest one you can. I'm just telling you, there are places in this world where they would give anything just to own a, a, a paperback copy. 
with just some of the word of God in it. And yet we have nice leather bound uh, quality leather Bibles collecting dust on our coffee tables. We live in a day and age when uh, full grown adult men spend more time playing video games than they do play, reading the word of God. Amen. And, and yet there are parts of this world where there are people, listen, when I went down to South America, I met preachers, preachers, pastors that never owned a leather-bound Bible. Now, you take a minute to think about that, all right? I'll never forget, we were um, handing out Bibles. Uh, we had a load of Bibles that came in, uh, and uh, we were going to different houses, me and another brother uh, giving uh, uh, Bibles for free to folks, paperback Bibles. And I'll never forget the reaction of one young lady. She was like maybe 17, 18 years old. And when we gave her a Bible, she started crying. And she, 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 she held that thing like this to her chest and started hugging it. And you know what she said? Now, this is going to sound real flowery because, you know, I'm in a hardcore Marine Corps type of town. And so this kind of thing, you know, is going to, it makes you, you know, all, all uncomfortable. But I'm just telling you the way she reacted. She hugged that Bible and kissed it. And she said, I have never had a boyfriend in all my life. She said, but the way that I feel holding the word of God in my hands, this must be what it feels like to be in love. And I'm just saying, I, most of us can't even relate to that because we take the Bible for granted. We have all kinds of copies of the Bible laying all over the place and don't even read them on a consistent basis. Shame on us. But here, here's, here's the thing. Why do we have over 200 versions of the Bible in English when there are 3,000 languages on the planet that don't even have one verse of Scripture translated in their language. I'll never forget, years ago, I talked to Brother Wayne Fair, <clears throat> our missionary. He's about to retire from uh, the mission field of having served in Papua New Guinea for over 30 years now. And uh, I'll never forget, he said, Brother Manny, do you realize when we first went to Papua New Guinea, the best version of the Bible we had available to minister from in, in the pidgin language was a good news for modern man. Now take a minute to think about that. And take a minute to think about how privileged we are. Because the good news for modern man is one of the most corrupt Bibles out there. Very corrupt. But what do you do when God calls you to minister to a group of people that speak a certain type of language, and the best Bible they have available is a very bad one, a very corrupt one. That's the best you can do. Can you imagine how uncomfortable that would be? But see, we that are English-speaking brethren, because we're so spoiled with, with God's blessings and with the King James Bible, we take these things for granted. But if you would take into consideration the famine that is in the land, in all this world, when it comes to the word of God, you, you, you would learn, it would do you well to learn to appreciate this book that we hold in our hands, you know? And so, but, you know, 3,000 languages. We're spending millions and millions and millions of dollars to produce versions of the Bible in English that we don't need. We don't need over 200 versions of the Bible in English, the King James Bible is good enough. Amen. And yet 3,000 languages, no Bible whatsoever. Why don't we focus all that money, all that energy, all that effort into the translation of God's words for these, for these billions of people on the earth that have never even seen a verse of Scripture in their entire life? But here's the thing, because... The brother just said it a minute ago. It's all about money. The love of money is the root of all evil. They're in it for money. All right. Don't act like I'm getting on y'all's case. Yes, sir. Go ahead. If there's anybody who needs a Bible, I have. I give some away, and they're pretty nice. This nice. So just let me know. That's a good point. Um. We, I was talking to Brother Kenny. I think we need to order some more giveaway Bibles, King James Bibles. You can get them from uh, Beacon of Truth there in Florence, South Carolina. We need to get us another box or two. So just ha it's always, it, it's, it, it'll always be good to have some Bibles we can just give away to folks. You know, uh, sometimes you'll get visitors that don't, don't have any Bible. And even though everyone, 
you know, most Americans can scrounge up enough money to get them a nice, decent Bible down at Barnes and Nobles or even at Walmart or something like that, a King James Version. But, but at the very least, it'd be nice to have those paperback giveaway Bibles to get people started. And so, uh, anyways. So the, the pure text, they go by different names. Here's another name that the pure text will go by sometimes. Sometimes it's referred to as the majority text. Now, why is it called the majority text? It's, sometimes, it's called the uh, majority text because it is based, the type of text that underlies and supports your King James Bible is supported by the majority, the majority of evidence from the manuscripts, okay? For example, it's the rival to the received text or the traditional text or the majority text, its rival is called the critical text. The critical text is based upon the minority amount of manuscripts. So if you were to put it in a pie chart, if you look, if, real soon we're going to have uh, the screen up on this side uh, by the end of, 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 of next month. But uh, if you look on the screen, you'll see a little pie char chart. You see all that space in blue? That's the amount of manuscript evidence that supports the King James Bible, if you were to put in a, in a, 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 a circular uh, chart there. You see that little tiny sliver in red? That, re that little tiny sliver in red represents the amount of evidence in the manuscripts that supports the critical text that underlies all the modern new Bibles outside of the King James. Now take a second to think about that. So remember we, we, we talked about this, that there are different, there's a variety of different types of manuscripts. Okay, so let's just talk about the papyrus manuscripts alone. There's nearly 90 of them, I believe, uh, right now as we speak. Okay, if you look at, if you look at this chart, you see that line, the green line? The green line represents all the papyrus manuscripts that exist on the earth today that we've discovered thus far. The, the purple line above it is the amount of those papyrus manuscripts that match and line up with the King James Bible in the received text. That little orange line represents the amount of papyrus manuscripts that line up with all the other Bibles outside of the King James Bible. Just to give you an idea, and that's just the papyrus manuscripts, okay? So this is why sometimes we refer to the text that underlie the King James Bible, the Textus Receptus, sometimes we'll call it the majority text. Remember we talked about the unsealed manuscripts? Now these were the manuscripts that was normally used by, by folks in upper society, and they were all cap letters in all of this. So. If you look at the green line on the bottom, the green line represents all unsealed manuscripts that exist on the earth today that have been discovered thus far. That purple line manuscripts, uh, that purple line manifests how many of these unsealed manuscripts support the King James Bible. That orange line represents the amount of unsealed manuscripts that don't support the King James Bible Instead, they support the NIV, ASV, ESV, all the rest of them. All right? That's the unsealed manuscripts. Now, remember we talked about the cursive manuscripts. And the cursive manuscripts, these were the manuscripts uh, that was used by the more common people, your everyday man, you know, your carpenters, your, 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 you know, those that work uh, uh, out in the streets, most of us. Uh, uh, the manuscripts that were used by the common man, they were, uh, they were the cursive manuscripts. And there's that green line representing all cursive manuscripts that exist on the earth. The purple line represents how many of them support the King James Bible and the received text. I don't even know if you can, bar you can barely see the orange line. That's how much doesn't support the King James. That's how much supports all the other new Bibles. And so no wonder it's called the manuscript uh, is called the majority text. Okay, and then, remember we talked about the ancient hymn books? So they've discovered uh, hundreds and hundreds of ancient hymn books, and in the back of the ancient hymn books, uh, they would have scripture verses, like in our red hymn books. There are scripture verses in them because back in the old days, the churches, uh, it was a very common thing for the uh, ancient churches, the older churches, to have public reading of the word of God. And back then they were able to do that because everyone was using the same version of the Bible, namely the King James Version. 
Try to do that in, in a lot of churches today. Uh, you'll have, you know, uh, this side, you'll, you'll have uh, uh, several people using the NIV, several people using the ASV, several people using the King James, others using the New King James, others using the English Standard Version. Try to read the Word of God in unison in a congregation like that. It might sound like they're speaking in tongues. But back in the old days, everyone read, read from the same Bible. And in the old ancient hymn books, exclusively all of the verses found in every ancient hymn book that has ever been discovered on the earth, they all line up with the King James Bible and the received text. You see the green line there? That represents all the hymn books, ancient hymn books discovered over the years. Notice the purple line. <laughs> that represents how many of them? How many of the ancient hymn books uh, match with the King James and the received text? 100%. That's why there's not even a line in, in, above it. Zero <laughs> percent uh, support the new Bibles in your ancient hymn books. That's why you never hear modern day Bible scholars that support these new Bibles, you never hear them talk about the ancient hymn books because they can't find any support for their theories and their Bibles from the ancient hymn books. Amen. And so, uh, so that's the reason why we'll refer to the received text as the majority text because the majority of the evidence backs up the type of text that underlies our King James Bible. Now, another terminology I want you to, to be familiar with is it's sometimes also called as the Antiochian text. Why is it called the Antiochian text? Well, if you'll remember, if you'll go to the book of Acts chapter 11. Let's go to the Bible for a second. Go to Acts chapter 11. Um, in his book called the Under, An Understandable History of the Bible, the author uh, uh, Gip on page 59 writes, it may well be that many of the originals that we have heard so much about were written right there in Antioch. Now, that's very interesting, okay? If you'll look at Acts chapter number 11, look at uh, verse number... Well, look at verse number... Let me start in verse 19. Remember when um, in Acts chapter 7, uh, Stephen, who was one of the first deacons elected in the church of Jerusalem, Stephen uh, preached a scathing message in Acts chapter number 7 before the Jewish... Supreme Court called the, the Sanhedrin. And, uh, and the Jewish leaders, okay, those Jewish leaders were so upset and offended with the preaching of Stephen because basically Stephen told them to their faces, you guys are responsible for crucifying your own Messiah, Jesus Christ, and you need to repent. Well, they got so ticked off at Stephen for that message that they stoned Stephen to death. And if you remember, when they stoned Stephen to death, there was a, a young man amongst those Jewish leaders by the name of Saul. Saul was his Jewish name. His Roman or Gentile name is Paul. And Paul, as the Jewish religious Jewish leaders were stoning to death Stephen because they were so upset with his message, they, they killed him and made him a martyr for the faith. And standing there in agreement, holding the coats, holding the coats, the raiment of those that were stoning to death. And the Bible says that he was there in agreement with what they were doing as they were uh, killing Stephen, uh, a deacon in the church. That man, uh, Saul, was there present supporting the murder of Stephen. Okay? And so that murder of Stephen initiated a great persecution that took place in the early church, which was very unfortunate in one sense because when you read about the development of the church of Jerusalem from Acts chapters 2 to chapter 6 before Stephen was murdered, folks were getting saved in that church by the thousands. Remember that? In Acts chapter 2, 3,000 on the day of Pentecost, 3,000 people got saved, baptized, and added to the church on the same day. One shot. We're going to baptize several people tonight. After services, make sure you be here for th that you're here for that. But could you imagine if we had 3,000 people saved on the same day and then we had to get them all baptized? Man, I I'd be so wore out. As a matter of fact, I don't even know if I want to pastor 3,000 people. I think I'd qu quit. That's 3,000 problems in your life. 
But I'm just saying, that's how much the, the Lord was working in the early church. People were getting saved through the preaching of the apostles and their disciples and their converts. People were getting saved by the thousands. That thing grew. By the time you get to Acts chapter 4, it grew to over 5,000 in the church. Imagine that. So imagine how excited the people must have been to see thousands of people getting saved, baptized, and, and, and joining the church. But then they elect deacons. And one of those deacons gets to preaching like a raven maniac and the Jewish leader stoned him to death. So after they murdered Stephen, this initiated a great persecution that busted up the church membership of the church of Jerusalem. This church that was, that was numbered in the thousands got all busted up because as, as uh, that, that young man that was standing there agreeing with the murder of Stephen saw... According to chapter 8, he took it upon himself to lead up this great persecution. He went on a crusade with fellow Pharisees to hunt down Christians that were leaving Jerusalem to run and hide for their lives. And these Christians that, that, that were members of the church of Jerusalem, they went all throughout Palestine. Some went all the way as far as, as southern Turkey to try to hide the wrath of, of Paul and his inquisition against the Christian church. Okay? Well, you know the story. On, in Acts chapter number 9, here comes Paul with his entourage of inquisitors. They, he just got permission from the leaders of Jerusalem to travel all the way to southern Turkey to Damascus, where, which was where uh, Paul grew up, his old stomping grounds. He says, hey, look, I know that area. I grew up around there. So uh, no, there's no one better to go hunt down the Christians that are hiding up there than me. So give me permission in writing to go hunt them down. I'll go up there and I'll arrest them. And anyone that doesn't comply, I'll kill them like I've been doing already. Paul was, any Christians that did not comply, Paul was killing them according to his own testimony. Paul was the number one enemy of the church. Well, I love this story. God saved the number one enemy of the church, turned the, turned the church's number one enemy into the church's number one hero. That's what God does. And so, you know the story. Paul, with his, uh, with his group, they're on the way, on the road to Damascus to go arrest Christians and persecute them. And on the way, Jesus shows up. And long story short, Paul gets saved. On the road to Damascus, he realizes, I was wrong all this time. These Christians that I've been persecution, persecuting, they had it right. Jesus is the Savior, and I'm in trouble. He repents. He trusts Christ as a Savior. The Lord changes Paul. Okay, well, after Paul's conversion, the Lord introduced to Paul two individuals that would disciple Paul as a new convert, as a new believer. Okay, the first one was a fellow by the name of Ananias who lived up in Damascus, uh, up where Paul was, was from. Okay, so Paul, however, uh, after his conversion, he went down to Jerusalem to introduce himself as a new convert of their religion, of Christianity, but they had to be like a bunch of Baptists, those Christians there, because they were very skeptical of Paul. They said, I don't know about this guy. I don't trust this guy. Just a few weeks ago, this guy was killing us left and right, and now he's trying to tell us that he's one of us? I think this is another trick Paul's trying to play here to try to, you know, he's trying to get, a, get us to warm up to him, and then once he's got us all warmed up, then he's going to get us. And so the brethren down in Jerusalem, they didn't trust Paul, okay? So in Antioch of Syria, which was hundreds of miles above uh, Jerusalem, okay, I want to say about 300 miles or so, uh, Antioch of Syria, right, uh, 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 north of Jerusalem, uh, there was a church where many of the Christians that fled Jerusalem due to the persecution, they gathered and hid in the metropolis of Antioch of Syria. Antioch of Syria was one of the major cities in the Roman Empire. Think of New York City, Los Angeles, Atlanta, Georgia, you know, a, a major city. Okay, that's what Antioch of Syria was. So what a great place to hide if you're a Christian to try to hide yourself amongst a large populace and try to, you know, it'd be a little bit harder for Paul and his crew to hunt us down and catch us and kill us over here. So they meet up in Antioch of Syria and they form the church of Antioch. And uh, 
the church in Jerusalem sends a fellow by the name of Barnabas to basically be the pastor and leader of that church in Antioch. So Barnabas was a very charitable, very compassionate man. He was not as hard and hard-nosed as, as, as some of the Christians down in Jerusalem. So uh, Barnabas was a guy that said, you know what, I'm going to give Paul a chance. I think he is real. And so Barnabas tells Paul, hey, hey, listen, the church down in Jerusalem, they won't accept you, but you come over here and I'll train you. I'll teach you the word of God. I'll, get, I'll help you grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. And so Barnabas was a very important man in the early development of the church. So Paul's training and discipleship, a large portion of it, took place in the church of Antioch of Syria. Now, I'm telling you all of this Bible and church history so that you can understand the significance of this area, Antioch of Syria. To the point of the author we just read, it's possible that many of the scriptures in their original manuscripts, many of them probably were written right there in Antioch of Syria, where Paul was being discipled and trained for the ministry and where Mr. Barnabas was serving as the pastor and leader. It's a very strong possibility. And the reason why that's very significant to note is because this is where the disciples were first called Christians in Acts chapter number 11. Are you with me? Amen. Acts chapter 11, look at verse number 26. And when he had found him, well, verse 25, then departed Barnabas to Tarsus for to seek Saul. I just got done explaining that. He, he, he looks for Paul and wants Paul to come to serve under his leadership so that he can disciple and train Paul. Verse 26, and when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch, and it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch, Antioch of Syria. So sometimes the traditional text or the received text is known as the Antiochian text in, in, in recognition of the place where the disciples were first called Christians because the belief of many Bible-believing Christians is that it is very possible that many of the original manuscripts were written right there in Antioch of Syria where the disciples were first called Christians. All right. Now, uh, the originals... They're sometimes called the autographs. And from time to time, I'm going to mention these terminologies on purpose so that whenever, if you ever decide to do a little extra studying for yourself, you're going to run across some of these fancy words. And I want you to uh, have a basic understanding of what these words mean and what they're referring to. Sometimes uh, when they're talking about the originals, you'll, you'll hear the word the autographs. Okay, These are the fer very first documents upon which the prophets and apostles and other uh, Bible writers wrote upon, okay? The autographs or the originals, they don't exist anymore. However, because God promised to preserve his words, the words of the originals, we have them today. Yes. How do we have them? Well, we have them through two different means, either through the faithful copying of those original words or through the precise and perfect, trans the accurate translation of those words. So here's two basic ways that God preserved his words, his original words, his pure words. How? Through faithful copying. Remember when we discussed the, the fanatical way that the, that the, the old Jewish scribes would, would copy the scriptures? They're even taking a bath just right before they write down the word Jehovah. I mean, they had, we went through the list of these very extreme rules that they went by to ensure accuracy preciseness and perfection. And then we talked about how in the, when it comes to the New Testament scriptures, the responsibility has now been given upon the Christians. And so for many years, you have, you have had faithful Bible-believing Christians that believe all the same things you and I believe that before the invention of the printing press for many centuries made it their habit to hand copy, to hand write the words of God, word for word, verse by verse, word for word, letter, letter by letter. And not only through the faithful copying of the words of God, but through the accurate translation. You see, accurate, an accurate translation is so important when you're trying to determine the difference between what is pure and what is corrupt. Why is it important? Because you can compare. You see, I don't have the original manuscripts. No one does. The originals don't exist anymore. But you don't need them because I can read my accurate 
and faithful and perfect King James Bible. And guess what? Uh, because of the promise of preservation, I can have faith that anything that was on those original documents, I'll know what they said by just reading this faithful and perfect translation of those words in the English language in my King James Bible. In other words, what am I saying? Listen, just because you don't know Greek or Hebrew doesn't mean that you're, you, you will miss something from the Word of God. No, sir. That's not what God promised. He promised to preserve His words. Why did God promise to preserve His Word in every generation? You want to know why? Because you need them. <laughs> Man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. You need every word that God inspired. You need every single one of them if, if for your spiritual growth and well-being. And so that's why I do not believe that e even though this is not the original documents, but it is a perfect translation of those original words that God has preserved for us. So even though we don't have the originals, I can have confidence that everything that God intended for me to have when those prophets and apostles were writing them down for the very first time, you know what? I can read my King James Bible and have confidence that I'll get everything that I need, everything God ever intended from the originals. Why? Because God preserved them. God pre Brethren, why in the world would God inspire a bunch of words that if he didn't intend for you and I to be able to have them in our day and time? What good do, does a bunch of perfect originals uh, do for anyone that doesn't have them? We need those words. And guess what? We have those words. And you have them in English right here in the King James. All right? Faithful copying, accurate translation. Now, as we go forward, we're, going to, we're wrapping up here. As we go forward, we're going to look at the history of these Bible manuscripts in conjunction, in relation to the early churches. And we're going to, we're going to go throughout history. And, and I'm, I'm going to do my best to make it as interesting as possible and not to get too bogged down in a bunch of boring details. But if you were to break uh, the history of the traditional text down in three time periods, you would have the early church period, which would cover the time period from 100 to 300 A.D. You would have a time period called the Byzantium period. We'll explain to you why it's called that uh, going forward. That covers the time period of 300 to 1400 A.D. And then you would have the time of the Protestant Reformation going forward, which would be somewhere around 14 to 1500 A.D. going forward. Okay, we're going to break it down in those three time periods and, and look at the different types of uh, ways that God preserved his pure words in these different time periods so that you and I can have them in our day and time. Amen. All right? That's what we're going to study. All right? So I tell you what, let's just go ahead and stop right there for now, and we'll go ahead and take a break. Let's all stand. And next Sunday, Lord willing, we'll begin tracing uh, some of the different, we're going to look at some of the different Bible translations and the different lang languages that God used to preserve his words, okay? And, uh, and what's, what, what I'm really looking forward to discussing is, I want, brethren, what I want you to see, I want you to see what early Christians went through to make sure you and I today can have a copy of the Word of God. Amen. There are Christians that have given their lives for this book. So excuse me if some of us get a little bit stirred up and fanatical about it. Right. Amen. There are Christians that have bled so that we, so that the next generation, so that their children and their grandchildren can have a pure copy of the pure words of God. Brethren, this book we hold in our hand, you'll never find a greater treasure than this book right here. Amen. We need to treasure this book. We need to love this book. People say, you King James Bible believers, you're a bunch of bibliolaters, is what they say. You worship the Bible. We don't worship the Bible, right. but we do worship the author of the Amen. Bible. And we do love the Bible. As the psalmist said, thy word is very pure. Therefore, thy servant loveth it. Amen. Do you love the Bible this morning? Amen. Amen. All right. Let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll take a break, and we'll see you in the next hour. Brother Andrew Andrews, why don't you ask the Lord's blessing upon the next hour, brother? <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we come before you, and we just thank you. 
and we humble ourselves for each and every day, all the things that you give us, and thank you for the word of God. Thank you for the King James 16 11, that we may grow and that we may go into this world and truly share your light with those that are lost, and that you may just be with us in this midst and be in the presence each and every day, and that you may bless this next service. Anyone that comes to visit us today, may they found salvation if they're not saved, Lord. And may you just be with us each and every day, because I know for sure that I'm not worthy to stand in your presence. And I just truly thank you for your grace and your mercy. Thank you for all the brethren. Thank you for the fellowship. And may you just be with us each and every day and grow stronger and stronger in thy will and not our own will, and that we may die to self each and every day and just continue to live in your grace and mercy. And all these things we ask in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you.